Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel, 3 o'clock block here on Think Tech. We're talking, of course, about energy in America with our, with our regular informed uh, uh, guest, Lucien uh, Pugliarisi, who is the CEO of ePrink in Washington, D.C. Welcome back to the show, Lucien. Hi, Jay. Great to hear you and see you. And by the way, Lucien, I have a special surprise for you, one <laughs> sure. you will remember. Okay, <laughs> for many years, Mina Morita was the chair of the Energy Committee in the State House here. 15 years, more, 20 years? Well, 13 years as 13, chair. 13 years, 15 okay. 15 years as a legislator. And she yeah. was done with that. <laughs> she went to the PUC as the chair. She served a full term there as the PUC chair. Now she's a, a, a blogger and a consultant in energy, mm -hmm. runs a, a, a blogging a, a site called Energy Dynamics. Right. You can look it up. Mm -hmm. And uh, she is going to join us today, Lucian. Are you happy? Sure. Aloha, Lou. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. So I wanted to, uh, you know, follow up on our earlier discussion and talk about uh, the, uh, the uh, climate change accord out of Paris last year and um, the president's uh, current um, uh, machinations, to use the word, on whether he will pull out or not pull out of the, of the Paris Accord. And I, I first, a couple of days ago, it looked like he was considering um, that, that he may not pull out. But then the New York Times uh, reported today that maybe he's going to, re going to pull out. And uh, there might be something else in the last few hours on his inclinations in the matter. But let's talk about that. Let's talk about how that affects energy, Lou. Uh, what so are your thoughts? So I, I think it's very important to understand. I think we've talked about it. I, I brought a few slides. So I guess I'm in the category of what you would call a lukewarmer. Okay. I believe the climate is changing, but I think there is still considerable un uncertainty on the scale and scope of that change. And I think there's considerable uncertainty on man versus uh, uh, natural contributions to long-term climate. I mean, and I... And I, and I think that this is not necessarily really wrapped up in this decision whether to go forward with Paris or not. I think that's a political issue having to do with a, a couple of issues. One is the president's uh, kind of view to a lot of his constituencies who felt that these uh, elites, you know, the International Association of Name Droppers, the Davos attending folks, all these people thought what was good for them was to sign on to this climate deal when in fact uh, the, you know, the, the, the programs themselves being implemented do not seem to be based on cost effective strategies but just sort of whatever the whims of uh, you know, the, the local elites. Now I'm not saying that's exactly what's happening but I do say that is a stream in the political consciousness that is affecting Trump right now. And I would say the Steve Bannons and the more, you know, Trumpian folks are pushing him to pull out of the agreement. I would say Gary Cohen, the head of the National Economic Council, probably Jared Kushner and Ivanka. Many uh, major oil companies are also uh, encouraging him to stay in the agreement. And one possible compromise would be to stay in the agreement and to, uh, but to go forward with certain uh, changes in U.S. policy, particularly uh, maybe altering the clean power plan, maybe pulling away from some of the very costly alternatives and try to form a, a different kind of consensus. Well, uh, can, we, can we go to the question of what does the Paris Accord say about energy specifically? And how, so you know, the, why it becomes the such Paris a hot Accord topic. has these indicative national, you know, basically all the companies have gotten together, all the countries have gotten together, 100 countries have gotten together and made certain commitments right, uh, uh, to reduce their uh, greenhouse gas emissions versus a certain, uh, you know, base level. So the U.S. is going to bring its down from 2007 levels, I believe. And I think a lot of the criticism of the agreement is that, I mean, the two criticisms of these kinds of agreements. First, um, it's not binding in any traditional sense. It's not a treaty. It was not approved by the Senate. 
Second, the U.S. tends to follow these agreements, and the other participants do not. I mean, this is generally the, and so we would have a lot of moral suasion with folks. I brought a few slides on what's going on in China and where some of the debate takes place. And it's clear to me that, um, you know, I think we spoke about this before, remember, the U.S. never signed up for the Kyoto Accord. Yes. Yet we exceeded the targets of the Kyoto Accord by some substantial volume, right? Largely through efficiency and market-based uh, uh, you know, market improvements and, and the general trend within the U.S. economy to move to lower uh, uh, carbon-based fuel systems. And also the, the function of our economy itself changed. We moved out a lot of heavy industry to lighter high-tech things. Mm -hmm. Well, Mina, you have uh, questions or comments about exactly how this should be treated? Um, no, but it is interesting to hear from Lou, and especially that perspective, the focus on cost effectiveness. I don't think that the, we have any disagreement there. Uh, I, I think what concerns me is that, you know, this is getting the whole world to focus and work towards um, a common goal to um, address climate change. And I think that's, that's what concerns me is, you know, the United States is a major world leader backing out rather mm -hmm. than staying in to help uh, the international community massage us towards this common goal. Yeah, well, and, that, and that is uh, connected in many ways with the other mm, the other positions that this administration is taking mm -hmm. um, against um, the views of Europe, the you know the the mm -hmm. consensus in Europe, and for that matter in Asia. So we isolate ourselves as a political matter. So, you know, and that, that does affect the decision. I mean, if, if, if you were advising, Lou, if you were advising the president, this is a hard one, huh? What would you tell him? You know, all things considered, Lou, what would you tell President Trump right now on his uh, decision, his cliffhanger decision that everybody in the <laughs> environmental community and the energy community waiting to hear about? So I don't think the president is uh, prepared. I mean, I don't think the president would listen to anything I would have to say. And, you know, we generally do not like to take uh, position. We try to lay out the numbers and let the people above our pay grade decide these things. But I do think if I were the president and if I were doing advice him, I'm saying, look, there's a lot of nonsense in this deal. But you want to stay at the table and say you're willing to go back to the table. But you want to really change the whole dynamic. And the whole emphasis should be, okay, let's proceed with the low-cost abatement strategies first. Mm -hmm. And those are in China and India. Why, are we, why is some guy in East L.A. working two jobs so some Hollywood producer can drive a Tesla? <laughs> Meanwhile, for a, a hundredth of that price, I can get the same emissions reduction by merely getting the Chinese to maybe operate their coal plants more efficiently. I could take the particulates out of the atmosphere if they just turn the scrubbers on. <laughs> so, you know, I think there is a real issue here that, you know, lots a lot of things government do, sometimes they, they don't care so much about what they cost, right? And so we have a kind of whack-a-mole approach. And I would, you know, I would sort of take the, the, the Bjorn Lomborg place, okay, Let's reorient this to, to basic research and fundamental technologies. We've spoken about this before, Jay. We have to solve the intermittency problems with wind and solar. So let's ramp up the investment on batteries. Let's accept that carbon capture and storage probably is too expensive and not going to work. And he could really go there and sort of knock some heads and make people confront the inconsistencies and the contradictions in what they've signed up for because like a lot of these international agreements people love to go to paris the food's good you know you have a nice time and uh, but people in you know, countries are unwilling to make the kind of hard-headed commitments they really want to do we're going to do that we're actually doing quite a bit yeah. the u.s has emissions in fact if you look here u.s emissions have are on the decline now and even under this agreement our our commitment is to cut our emissions by 17% by 
by 2020 and 28% by 2025. There is no reduction in Chinese emissions until they peak in 2030. Ah. Okay. So now the Chinese have a lot of stories about that. They can say, well, you know, you've been loading into the environment a long time. We're still growing. Your per capita emissions are different than ours. But the point is, is that there's a lot of bad environmental practices taking place in China. Well, let me ask this before we uh, move to our break. And that is, um, with all of these considerations and all this advice flying around and all the press coverage, which may or may not be helpful, um, what do you think he's going to do, Lou? If I had to guess, and I'm not really good at uh, uh, political forecasting, I thought Hillary was going to win the election, okay? So I would say he will probably try to find some modified way to stay in. But the pressure he is getting from a lot of the central constituencies that feel he made a commitment to them is enormous. Mm -hmm. And you can look at the work coming out of Texas and Texas Public Policy Foundation, Manhattan Institute, and uh, they, very substantive work are you know, revealing a lot of the con contradictions in the agreement and a lot of the an imbalance in it. And this feeds into the, so the narrative of America first, right? It's how yeah. the U.S. got taken to the cleaners on this deal. Yeah, yeah interesting. Yeah. Comments, Mina? No, I, I, you know, I think there are a lot of opportunities for the United States if we stay in, and basically in um, research development, technology development, in showing cost-effective ways to move forward. I mean, even though you have that trajectory for China and India, I mean, there are cases to be made for um, these, uh, these developing countries um, leapfrogging to uh, cleaner technologies much faster mm -hmm. and hopefully using technologies that we, we developed and we're selling to them. <laughs> so would you, would you accept the, the accord? Would you accept uh, the Paris Agreement or would you want to modify it? I mean, I, I'm really interested in, in Lou's uh, thought that the president may very well elect to modify it given all the, the factors and influences involved. Well, I think the only way that you could modify it and and have your cake and eat it too is staying at the table you know so got to stay at the table yeah. there's mm -hmm. so many reasons to stay at the table mm -hmm. as the president of the united states the greatest power on earth right isn't that mm -hmm. right yes. it still is right right <laughs> i hope so <laughs> <laughs> you should stay at the table okay we'll take a short break that's lou pulirisi he's the ceo of eprink in washington uh and mina morita a former chair of the energy committee in the house uh the chair of the puc and now a, an energy consultant we'll be right back you'll see you're watching Think Tech on thinktechhawaii.com, which broadcasts five live talk shows from noon to 5 p.m. every weekday, and then streams our earlier shows all night long. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Hi, I'm Carol Cox. I'm the new host of Eyes on Hawaii. Make sure you stay in the know on Hawaii. Join us on Tuesdays at 12 noon. We will see you then. Aloha. Freedom. Is it a feeling? Is it a place? Is it an idea? At Dive Heart, we believe freedom is all of these and more, regardless of your ability. Dive Heart wants to help you escape the bonds of this world and defy gravity. Since 2001, Dive Heart has helped children, adults, and veterans of all abilities go where they have never gone before. Dive Heart has helped them transition to their new normal. Search DiveHeart.org and share our mission with others. And in the process, help people of all abilities imagine the possibilities in their lives. A whisper, Mike. No. Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel, and I'm here talking with Lucian uh, Pulirisi, Lou Pulirisi in Washington by Skype, and Mina Morita here in the studio with me. I'm talking about the Paris Accord, which has been in the news for the last few days. Uh, that's a real cliffhanger, I must say. So let's go to the question of the two differential, or possibly the three differential possibilities. One, and I'd like to explore what you think will happen. Okay, if the president says, I am bowing out of this thing. I'm going to, you know, terminate U.S. involvement in the Paris Accord. Um, what happens? What happens to the energy community? Uh, if I don't, if you don't mind me asking, what happens to the 
you know, U.S. diplomatic relations with Europe and, for that matter, with Asia. And what happens in this country in terms of the development of clean energy? Okay, what do you think, Lou? What's so, going to so happen first, if he says no? Let, let's just say he pulls out completely. Yeah. And after all, the elites and stuff have heart attacks and jump off of buildings. We'll go back to a certain kind of world. And that world is one in which natural gas, mm -hmm. which continues to expand at a, a very rapid rate, pushes out coal. Uh, a world in which the states, through renewable portfolio standards for local efficiencies, for the much vaunted 100% renewables that the Hawaiians seem to think is the answer, uh, those, those will continue. Okay. So the U.S. actually the utility sector, with and without the clean power plan, it will have not a substantial effect. So the question is, and I think a lot of people, a, a lot of, you know, even major companies believe, well, that's why they want to stay at the table. Because really, we can kind of be part of an international, uh, international agreement in which we don't get excluded. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm unconvinced that the huge amount of money, however, that DOE has spent on the Advanced Research Projects Energy Agency have actually resulted in much good. I mean, I really think they have they've had spread themselves across a dozen different technologies. They don't have a fundamental strategic vision of where the high payoff is. And, and, and I'm not, it's not clear to me that Trump has the instruments and the staff to actually fix this kind of stuff. But I do think it would be good to have a debate on it and see yes. what we can do. So yes. um, I, I don't think, I think if we dropped out of the agreement and it, it's going to cause problems, particularly in international trade and there's going to be a lot of animosity. I'm not sure it's going to make a fundamental difference given the nature of the way lower carbon fuels are emerging in the U.S. A difference in energy, but uh, you know, I'm just, I'm sort of com um, comparing this um, with uh, Trump's uh, engagement with An Angela Merkel a few days ago, uh, where she said, "It looks like we're going to have to go on our own." I mean, this was really not a good meeting at all. Uh, I, I agree. Like he's but pushing remember, away from Europe. Uh, electricity now is a luxury good in Germany. They've sort of followed the Hawaiian path, you know, and it's turning out to be very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, so I worse... think there's plenty of room for policy reform on both sides of the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm not a big fan of the way uh, of sort of Trump, Trump's interaction. <laughs> his yeah. way he deals with people, I think, is about half of his problems. <laughs> really? At least. Well, Lou, least. I, I, I think Germany is dealing with stranded assets. At least we don't have that problem yeah. here yet. Yeah, yeah. You know, right now it's we're the right places to make our future investments. Uh, so, so that's the difference between Germany and Hawaii. But do you have... know my opinion on the rejection of the gas alternative for Hawaii. So mm -hmm. I won't go through that. But I really think that was a poor decision. Uh, I, I agree with you. I've written about <laughs> that, and I think it's a real poor decision. Uh, you found somebody on the same page, Lou. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't happen too often. <laughs> so let me, let me extend that question, though. And suppose he rejects this, which I think is a fair chance of that. Um, yeah. what, what effect on Hawaii? What, if, what special effect on Hawaii? Now, Lou suggested that maybe there was yeah. no effect on Hawaii. What do yeah. you think? Yeah, I, I don't think there's any effect on Hawaii. You know, you, I, again, you have the RPS in um, statue, um, we're on our own traje trajectory. Um, you know, coal is just not cost competitive with, yeah. um, you know, other uh, fossil or renewable resources right now. Does that yeah. does that mean that if we, if if Trump, um, you know, accepted the Paris Accord, simply said, okay, all right, we'll just status quo in the Paris Accord, whatever Obama did, I'll, I'll go along with that. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's likely, but let's assume he says that. What effect on Hawaii there? Um, no effect. Same either. thing, no yeah. effect. Yeah. Well, what about that? Suppose he I, says, I, I, I like the about Paris this Accord. more than once. The real issue for Hawaii is, in terms of climate, where should they put their resources? Is the real return 
in these, in these renewable strategies, which are going to be expensive and have absolutely no measurable effect on the Hawaiian or the world climate? Or should those resources be better put into adaption strategies and to preserve the, you know, the beaches and the beauty and the uh, tourist uh, attractiveness of Hawaii? I, I think actually it's a tragedy the Hawaiians did not have that debate. I'm not saying, and I don't want to preclude what the answer should be, but it's, it's a big mistake that the political leadership in Hawaii didn't say, okay, let's talk about this and let's figure out what's the most effective strategy for us to deal with climate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that, that is undone. I, I, I realize lots of people in Hawaii believe that the renewable approach is cheaper, right? I realize, mm -hmm. but I, I am very suspicious that that will occur. Uh, it's but 100% renewable will be I, cheap. I disagree with you on that, Lou. That has already occurred. Um, you know, it, not only is it um, comparable or less pricing, but there's less volatility in the system. Um, you look at the new uh, solar storage contracts that were negotiated by the Quiet Island Utility Cooperative that sort of set the standard for, for the nation. Um, when you're, you're getting that at far below avoided oil prices. Um, so I think, you know, what's, what we have in our statute, and sometimes it's been overlooked, is that um, the RPS has to be cost, um, cost effective and what, I forget how it's worked. But anyway, it has to be cost effective. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it wasn't this free for all for renewables. Where I think Hawaii has made a mistake is on the subsidization of renewables. Um, I, I, again, rooftop photovoltaics, which is one of your least efficient, cost effective um, strategies, is being subsidized through tax credits. Yeah. But look, this is the common practice in all these government renewable programs. Mm -hmm. The most effective biofuel program in the world mm -hmm. is the American program to mandate volumes of ethanol into the gasoline supply. Mm -hmm. And I don't know any objective analyst who doesn't think that has become a disaster for both the environment and for the fuel supply. So... <laughs> So, you know, it's a, these things are all about it. So we, it's really hard when the, you know, the governments really think they know best and they, they hate these kind of let consumers to decide. They want to pick winners and losers and it, it's not working out that great in all cases. Mm -hmm. I actually am a big fan of renewables and I really think that uh, if we can figure out the intermittency part of it, they're going to be fantastic. But we haven't got the intermittency solved yet. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the, the third scenario that you mentioned, the one that, uh, you know, may be the, the best thing that the president can do is, I mean, with all the influences and interests that are upon him, um, is to negotiate, renegotiate the agreement. First of all, does he have the, the clout to do that with the parties, uh, you know, who signed up on the accord in the first place? Is there a legal opening or a diplomatic opening for him to say, wait a minute, boys, new president in town, and there's a few things I want to change, and if you don't change them, I'm going to leave. Um, is there an opportunity for him to actually get in there and start renegotiating what was decided in the convention, the conference? I think that of course, I, I, there's a lot of in, interesting legal issues of how the U.S. would extract itself from this, whether it would take four years or we pull out entirely from the UN program, and that's probably not worth our time. I do think if he came back with a, a, you know, an underlying theme which said, look, let's think this through in terms of working collectively to fix the problem in a more cost-effective way. 
I think people would come to the table on that. I think there's a lot of frustration out there in Europe, especially, which has seen soaring electricity prices and uh, a lot of low economic growth. And and I, I think there would be some interest in that. Yeah, and and they might want to you know curry favor with him because he's hard to curry favor with. Uh, yeah. They may they may want to spend a little time mending fences in the hopes <laughs> of a better relationship on other issues in the future. But let me yeah. ask this though: yeah. if 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 we do renegotiate, if he wants to renegotiate, can you suggest a couple of points that he should focus on to renegotiate? So you're not going to like what I would say, but the reason to do that would be probably to allocate more resources to China and India and less to the developed countries, which are already moving forward with programs that are kind of going to continue whether he stays in the agreement or not. Mm -hmm. The real way to, is to sort of sort of cut back on the wasteful stuff and then look at the low-cost abatement strategies that are available in India and China. That's, that's where the payoff is. Mm -hmm. But nobody wants to talk about that because we don't want to help foreigners or whatever. You know, I mean, it's a tif wow. difficult problem. Yeah, there are ripple effects. Whatever you do, whatever you get into, you have a, a bunch of nations and everybody is self-interested and they all have their strategies and what have you. But let's also go back to uh, one last thing, and that is, you know, I'm, I'm reminded that uh, with the help of an architect from Brooklyn, uh, Mayor Blumberg in New York uh, started on a program to deal with uh, sea level rise in Manhattan, where sea level rise could be very damaging to the nation's financial center. Um, and he's actually, or the, the city rather, he's, he's done, but the city is actually moving forward on a plan to, to do infrastructure to protect Manhattan against sea level rise. I'm not sure what the engineering is, but, but they have the political will necessary to take steps. Uh, Hawaii has not yet found that political will. Um, wait, wait. <laughs> Mina no. is looking at me. <laughs> no, I think we should, especially after this past weekend. And, yeah. You know, with the king tides and a high surf, and you look at our industrial center, Mapunapuna area, getting right. flooded. It's very, it's right, it's, it's you, right at sea level. You look at our billion dollar coastline, Waikiki, getting inundated by the, the uh, high tide and surf affecting yeah. the hotel and the beachfront. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, like Lou mentioned earlier, you know, there needs to be a focus on adaptive strategies um, in planning. Adaptive strategies. Where everybody has to do that. They have to do that whatever Trump does on, on, the, on the Paris Accord. Yeah. And so the only, the only thing that I've, I'm left with to ask you, Lou, uh, I have other questions too, but <laughs> the only thing at this point I'm left to ask you with is this has an effect on the conversation. You mentioned we ought to have a conversation. Um, and to and to visit the question of whether to accept or reject Paris Accord at this time raises the possibility, if not the desirability, of continuing in a robust conversation to see if we can settle down in this country on what we really want to do vis-a-vis -vis the environment and energy. Um, do you see that as a positive, uh, or do you see it as well, a, a well, Of course, with Trump, that's un how likely is it for us to get a calming influence, but I mean... I have always felt that when climate is discussed as a religious issue, the traction is really poor with us. We don't, mm -hmm. you know, we can If you talk about it as a technocratic problem and you confront this whole issue of, you know, what are the cost-effective strategies and what are the losing strategies mm -hmm. and how do we get a robust approach where we try the, the kinds of things that might make a difference, yeah, that, that would be an interesting conversation. That is not the conversation we're having in Washington. Yeah. There is no climate issue which is not worth a gazillion dollars in Washington. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't care how bizarre it sounds. You cannot, I mean, we don't do climate. But if you go to the think tanks that do climate, they have a, you know, they have a, a guy to take your coat. They have fancy cafeterias. You cannot imagine how much money is poured into this. Mm -hmm. It's just unbelievable. <laughs> We'll have to leave it there. Lou <laughs> Pugliarisi is CEO of EPRINC uh, here on Energy in America, and Mina Morita, former chair of the mm -hmm. State uh, Energy Committee and the PUC. Uh, thank you so much, both of you, for this very important and timely discussion. Let's see how it unfolds. We'll be thinking of you guys as we find out tomorrow or the day after what the president decides to do. <laughs> in any event, aloha both. <laughs>